Welcome everyone. As people roll in, it takes a few minutes. We're gonna just show you a glimpse of this amazing project we're gonna be talking about today. Don't worry if you don't fully understand it. We are gonna be walking through it much slower later, but for now, just sit back, take a look. And if you'd like, post in the chat where you're calling in from today and what your connection is to the forward or the Lower East Side or the Washington Post. They call that the old law tenement. We lived pretty, uh, pretty happily, you know, and, uh, but there was a lot of disease and sicknesses. They call that the old law tenement. We lived pretty, uh, pretty happily, you know, and uh, but there was a lot of disease and sicknesses. They call that the old law tenement. We lived pretty, uh, pretty happily, you know, and uh, but there was a lot of disease and sicknesses. kind of here. So Jenna, you can take that off the screen. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm Jody Rudoran, editor in chief of The Forward. And we are just so ecstatic about having this event in conjunction with the Washington Post and the Tenant Museum, two institutions close to my heart. My sister has worked at the Washington Post since 1989. Um, but that has nothing to do with this event. And I'm also just I'm so excited to see so many of you here. We have people from all over the country and the world with incredible connections to this region and this history. And I know this is gonna be a great conversation. I'm gonna take a minute to just introduce our amazing four panelists and then we'll dive right in. And I know some of you were worried that you couldn't see all the captions or, or read everything. We're, you don't worry about it. First of all, we're gonna put the link to the project um, in the chat and also in a follow-up email. So you'll be able to spend as much time as you want with it on your own. And Jen is also when she talks a little bit more about how they made the thing, she'll, she'll walk through it a little more slowly. So 
I'll start by introducing Jenna Parag, who is the deputy editor for strategic initiatives at the Washington Post and really spearheaded this project. Um, she, before going to the Washington Post, she was the senior director of video and immersive experiences at National Geographic Partners. And she was the New York Times' virtual, virtual reality editor, where she produced 15 immersive projects, including some that won big prizes. One was called The Displaced, which won the 200, 2016 World Press Award for innovative storytelling, and The Fight for Fallujah, which was nominated for a news and documentary Emmy. Also from the Washington Post, we have Philip Kennicott, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning art and architecture critic there. He's been um, on staff at the Washington Post since 1999. And one of the amazing things about Philip is that he started as a classical music critic, became a general cultural critic, and then since 2011 has been doing art and architecture. He won the Pulitzer, as I said, for criticism in 2013, but he was also a finalist two other times in 2012 and 2000. And his first book uh, called Counterpoint, a memoir of Bach and Mourning was published in 2020. We also have with us Annie Pollard, who's president of the Tenement Museum. She has a PhD in history from Columbia and um, is an author and a public historian. Before coming to the Tenement Museum or in between two stints at the Tenement Museum, she was also executive director of the American Jewish Historical Society. And one of her books is Emerging Metropolis, New York Jews in the Age of Immigration, which won the 2012 National Jewish Book Award. And then I'm thrilled to have again on our Zooms, Hannah Pollack, the Forwards Archivist. She is in charge of all of our research, translation, and she produces um, archival content that we display on the Forward um, and on our social media. And also she's been spearheading some really incredible innovative storytelling projects of her own partnering with the Urban Archive to do photo sort of virtual photo tours um, from the Forbes Archive of different places in New York City, and also was a curator of this incredible exhibit that we did with the Elder, the Elder Street Museum called Pressed. Um, and Hannah and I have had many great Zoom conversations with, I hope many of you who are here today. So as I said, I'm so excited about this conversation. It just brings together so many things I care about, um, in, including just the basic thing about innovative ways to tell stories. Um, this is something that the Washington Post and other publications have been really pushing the envelope on for now a couple decades. And Jen has been right there all along. So this project, which published first in December, right? I think it was December. Right. Um, uses a technology called photogrammetry. And I want to start, Jenna, by asking you to talk, tell us about what the heck is that? Um, how does it work? And well, let's start with that. What the heck is that? And how does it okay. work? And then we're going to get to how did we get to this project? Why is this project a great use of this technology? And we'll talk later about some other technologies. Sure. Um, well, photogrammetry is um, a technology that uh, where you take thousands and thousands of pictures of a space or an object and stitch them all together, combine them with a special software. We don't have to do that by hand anymore, but combine them all with a special software to create a 3D model of that object. So basically it's, the production isn't extremely complicated. You sort of walk around, take those thousands of pictures and then stitch them together. People used to do this with film cameras to make big panoramas and things like that. We're just doing it digitally now. Um, and what's really interesting about it is converting it into a 3D space that can become immersive and an immersive way to tell a story. Awesome. I want to also, I forgot to say at the top, I want to remind everyone, you are welcome to use the chat to comment on what you hear, to connect with someone else you see um, who you might have something in common with or whatever you want. If you have questions that you want me to pose to our panelists, we'd love you to put those, use the Q&A button, which should be right near the chat button on whatever tablet or phone you're on or device. Um, that way it's a little easier to keep track of the questions and we'll, we'll definitely have time for your questions and want to hear them. Okay, so Jenna, you've got this new technology, photogrammetry, mm -hmm. and you're like, what should we do with it, right? So how do we get from here's this cool technology to what we just saw? Why the Tenement Museum? How do different people get involved? Walk us through how this thing got born. 
Right. Well, um, maybe I'll just show some, some visuals too, while I explain this, is that all right with everyone? It's always easier to see these things than to just describe them. Um, so just give me a second. You're like a totally innovative storyteller, innovative panelist. Need my visuals. Okay. I'm just going to make sure my computer sound is shared. Okay, so this looks like a photograph of the exterior of 97 Orchard Street where the Tenement Museum is housed. But what it actually is, is like I said, thousands of pictures combined into a 3D model. And we're sort of angling the 3D model so it looks like we're standing on the street and looking up at the building. Um, and, you know, we, you know, I'm on a team called the uh, Lead Lab team at the Washington Post. We're like the research and development team at the Post. We're really interested in experimenting with new technologies um, and figuring out how they can apply to journalism, how we can create new experiences for our audience. And so the idea was we want to experiment with 3D spaces and photogrammetry. What's a good place to do it? We're in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of people haven't been able to go do all the cultural things that they might like to do. And we'd all visited separately uh, the Tenement Museum in the previous few years and thought, wouldn't that just be incredible to make that experience available to Washington Post readers? And I kind of knew that, you know, being in the Tenement Museum was what makes it so special, being able to feel the spaces see the incredible curation of all the artifacts. Um, so we got in touch with, with um, Annie and Annie's team at the Tenement Museum, and they were really into the idea because they also were thinking about reaching more audiences during the pandemic. Um, and I'll let Annie talk about that a lot more, but for now I'll stick with the technology and um, just sort of walk you through what this means. So all this is, uh, visualization of all those pictures to coming together. And in the interactive, which we'll give you the link for, you scroll and control the pace of, um, you know, how quickly this 3D model is moving around. We also added audio, a soundtrack to sort of make the feel a more immersive feeling to the piece. And we also were able to use audio interviews that the Tenement Museum had in their archive. They call that the Old Lord Tenement. We lived pretty, uh, pretty happily, you know, and uh, but there was a lot of disease and sicknesses. And that's that's an interview that the Tenement Museum did in 1992 with a former resident. So getting that firsthand memory from someone and then integrating it, they they do that so beautifully in the museum. But we were able to recreate that in this interactive as well. So again thousands of pictures all stitched together and then you're sort of able to move through the space, see all those little artifacts. And then those text boxes um, have Philip's incredible writing and his thoughts and about, um, you know, telling the story of how, um, how people dealt with public health issues in the past and sort of thinking about how that applies to our current day. So here's just a little glimpse at how to make photogrammetry. On the left, you have a LIDAR scanner, which effectively, in a non-destructive way, sends out little lasers in every direction and they bounce back so it can create sort of a map of the room. Um, sort of like echolocation, but with lasers. And then on the right, you see Andre, a member of our storytelling team, just methodically walking through and taking lots of pictures, which we're then gonna stitch together in post-production. But that's just a regular- Literally, Jenna, so I know yeah. you said thousands. How many photographs does it take to do a thing like this? This, I would say, I don't know the exact number, but I would probably say between five and 7,000 pictures were taken. Cool, sorry to interrupt you, keep going. No, that's quite all right. But you know, you have to stay pretty organized. You see, he's like moving yeah, very very <laughs> in a formulaic way, making sure he gets every angle on every wall. And then this is a look at what the raw model looked like. Um, very detailed. You can see. So you guys around. built this model? You at the Washington Post built this model? Yeah, we built this model based on all the data that we gathered at the Tenement Museum. They allowed us to fly drones on the exterior so we could get even the cornices on the top of the building, get all those details. And then you have it in. What is this model made of and about how big is it? You mean like gigabytes wise? Oh, it's just, I'm sorry. I was really thinking it was a physical model. It's obviously just oh, a physical wish. model. No, that's dumb of me. Okay, software. sorry. Yeah. No, I don't mean and gigabytes wise. Okay, great. Got it. 
I was going to ask you where it lives. Right. That's so stupid. Okay. No, so, but that's kind of the thing. You get you get this incredible, like digital artifact. But what do you do with it, right? It's kind of cool to spin it around a few times, but it's not interesting <laughs> until it has a story attached to it. And that's where Philip really came in and took a look at the project in this stage and said, let's fly the audience through the model and sort of tell this in-depth story and, and with firsthand experience, you know, firsthand audio and, and um, like help the reader understand what it was like to live in the space during times of pandemics and public health issues. Here's just another quick look. We're now on the third floor flying through some of the apartments. Um, what I especially like here is Archie comes back in to tell a very specific story. It was uh, dark because they had no electricity in those days. It was lit with gas, little gas lights. You had to keep feeding the meter, the gas meter with quarters. You know, I remember my father getting up on a chair and throwing a quarter in uh, when the lights went out, you know, and put another quarter in and we conserved it as, as much as we could. And he's talking about that gas meter up on the, and it, in a very specific memory. So it's so tactile to connect all these, you know, these interviews, these old interviews with the actual space. So you can move down the hall, see that, you know, the entire floor shared two toilets, I believe, right, Annie? We just did a model of one. Um, and then you go into another apartment that represents the Levine family, um, who, had, you know, they were seamstresses and, and made clothing in the, the living room, the kitchen, and a bedroom. See, each room had a window in it, but one room, one room had a window was like from the kitchen to the bedroom. He's talking about a window that was added in order to create greater airflow, potentially in response to tuberculosis outbreaks and public health concerns. So that's the idea, to like move you through the space and let the story unfold for you. Like I said, it's much better in per it, when you're in control of it and can go your own pace. So there's the, the link there. And I'll Great. Jody now. Um, thank you so much, Jenna. That was so cool. And so I want to get back to Philip and you were, you know, asking, to get to get to the good stuff about how the story gets integrated to the to the visuals, but I want to start with Dr. Pollard Pollen for a second to say, you know, what what's so great about the Tenant Museum, and I know from the chat that so many of the people here have been in it, and I think it's one of the best things I ever did with my kids because it is immersive. Also, that was so clearly a huge decision the Tenant Museum made whenever back when to say we're not going to have just pictures or even just pictures and audio. We're not going to have an exhibit. We're going to have a thing where you walk through. And of course, I mean, I remember that seamstress um, mannequin or whatever you call it. Uh, so specifically, I mean, I, you know, I've been there. I've been in that room, although it's interesting just watching it just now you can get a lot closer in a way, right? In a weird way. So I wonder from your perspective at the museum, someplace that was so committed to um, that immersive, the old school immersive idea, come and walk through kind of how you, I mean, what you thought when the Washington Post approached you, obviously perfect for the pandemic, but as at, at now looking back, like how does this connect to that philosophy of physical immersion? Now we've got digital immersion. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, thanks. And I just want to thank Jenna and Philip and everyone at the Washington Post for creating this. This was like a Hanukkah present. We thought Hanukkah didn't happen because it got kind of swallowed up by Thanksgiving, but like for the Tenement Museum, Hanukkah happened <laughs> in the form of this amazing interactive because um, look, I'm in that building all the time, even though it's been a pandemic. We're there, we're open, we host people, we walk people through. But there was something about experiencing this interactive where I notice things or I could see things in a way that I couldn't when I'm with people or when it's you know dark or I'm just walking quickly through the textures of the space like you really you can almost feel like you can rip off a piece of the paint chips that are that are coming down so for those of us I think who work in the tenement um, it was an amazing experience for us as well and I think there are things you can notice through this uh, and that you can pause and you can look up, look at and you can soak up in part because you're alone as opposed to being with a group of people and trying to kind of get views. You have an amazing view of everything. And um, so 
I think for us, this is in some ways just another form of immersion. This isn't the opposite of immersion. It's just simply another form of immersion. And you're absolutely right, Jody. The you know when the Tenement Museum opened, um, in the it opened to the public in the early 1990s, it was pretty radical to have a house museum that didn't have like a um, what's it called the ropes uh, those ropes right yeah. <laughs> blocking you from actually being there exactly and so you know to create these spaces that you could walk into was so important from the start and we have to thank you know the founders Ruth Abram and Anita Jacobson for being so aware of the importance of that of that immersion both in the recreated apartments and the apartments that we keep as 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 ruins so for us um, this is super exciting because we can think of ways to layer even more stories onto this technology because the oral history of um, Mr. Friedberg that you heard, there are hundreds of other oral histories that we're not using on an everyday basis and we can do the same thing and tell different stories because every room in that building has layers and layers of not just paint and wallpaper but layers and layers of stories and there's something about this technology that really helps us access that and it becomes just another way in addition to the physical spaces to tell stories which is what we're all about. Awesome so Philip turning to you as I said in your introduction, you've covered a variety of art forms over your career, um, mostly through flat-ish writing, although obviously as an art and architecture critic, you're very focused on visuals and physical spaces. And I wonder, um, but, but this is not the normal stuff of an architecture critic's job, I don't think. So I, tell us a little bit about how you got involved and what the project kind of opened up for you. Well, I got involved because Jenna had this amazing team assembled to put together the photogrammetry, and that was really a um, kind of a, a new experience to have the ability to represent a building with this kind of detail. Um, you know, I, I write about architecture, and mainly I write about new things. I write about new buildings, important civic buildings, uh, buildings that are important for aesthetic reasons, buildings that advance a particular architect's portfolio of, of creation. But here's a building that's utterly unprepossessing, but enormously important historically, a building that connects with so many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people's lived memories. And the technology allowed it to be new for people, right? I mean, we pass by these buildings, we walk through New York all the time, but this technology lets you go in. And I think because we are such visual people and we've become so closely um, addicted really to the things that we see on our screen, this was kind of a perfect way of taking something that's old, taking something that intersects with a lot of people's lives, but doesn't rise necessarily to the level of architecture in a lot of people's minds, and think about it as architecture. Think about it as a space. And, and the only thing that's really great about this technology and was exciting about the project is that it's dynamic. It lets you move through space. You know, when you, when you talk to architects, the thing they really stress is that a photograph is not going to give you the building. It's going to give you a set of static representations of the building. And even a video is going to give you a very sort of single point perspective. This is wonderful because it captures the dynamic experience of architecture. And it does it with all this enormous kind of accidental detail that a photograph offers. I love that. Um, my husband's an architect and now teaching high school architecture. And I love what you're saying about how, we, we, yeah, we think about it as the building and being about the building and the art and the decisions that the architect can make. But the idea that architecture is as much about the story of how people use the building is so fascinating. It's kind of mind blowing actually, right? That's, that's the whole point of architecture is to be in the building, to use it and to see and the way it's been used over time. Right. You know, if you think of the experience of going to, you know, a famous person's house, Monticello or Montpelier or Mount Vernon, you know, a founding father's house, what you get there is a wonderfully curated stage set. And you're invited to think about the space through the consciousness of a particular person. And you're invited to think of it usually at a very particular time. It's frozen in 1815 or 1765. The Tenement Museum doesn't do that. I think that's one of the really remarkable things curatorial about it is that it lets this building exist through decades and decades of, of, of its history. 
And it hasn't erased anything and it hasn't tried to create a perfect space. This is a building very much like a palimpsest, bears the imprint, the markings, the tracings of all the people who have lived there. And they haven't tried to erase that. And that's what makes it really interesting from an architectural perspective, because that's how we experience buildings, right? I mean, you think of your house, what are you thinking about? Is your roof leaking? Are there holes in the rugs? You know, is the floor creaking? All of these things that are kind of burnished out of the more prepossessing buildings that are often the subject of this kind of story. So Hana, it's hard to imagine anyone, maybe other than Annie and some of the people at the museum who know more about this building and people like Archie Friedberg and the artifacts we see than you. You have been living this history. Uh, I'm sure you've been to the Tenement Museum many, many times. Um, and you also have been living and working with the underlying um, our other art related artifacts through the Forwards Archive and our own history in that very neighborhood for so long. So I wanted to ask you about, for you, what was the experience like? Someone who knows so much about it, what did this project bring someone like you that was new and different and whether it's in feeling or in knowledge? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, just, just riffing off of um, what Philip was just saying about like a sensibility sort of remaining because of the artifacts, but also with this technology because of immersion, because of like movement. And so I was thinking about how my day-to-day, -day, you know, looking over the photographs in our collection, right? The Forwards Morgue is kind of like a flat experience, but then the back issues of our paper kind of render me, they give me all that sensibility, the voices, just like this project did. So it's, it's very, you know, mind blowing to actually see it all put together like that. It's almost like having, you know, every article in the paper, every, every quote in the paper, right? It sort of come to life through, through this uh, movement. And the other thing I was thinking about was like, how many times in our paper that I know of, was architecture kind of like a really, really critical factor in exploring, explaining, experiencing life on the Lower East Side, life, you know, from our writers, from our readers, right? And so um, I was thinking about on our 50th anniversary in 1947, uh, Yisrael Fogel uh, was our labor uh, editor, and he was tasked with actually recreating the building. We, you know, people uh, probably know in 1912, we built a historic 10 story building, it's still there at 175 East Broadway. Um, it's no longer our building, it's private, it's condos, but the building itself, um, he described like floor by floor, starting with the elevator, you know, like what happened to you when you were in the forwards elevator? So when I saw this experience, it sort of brought that article um, back to me and sort of the joy and the, the um, you know, geschmack, we would say in Yiddish, it's like delicious. There's this sort of flavor, right? That's what we're talking about, this kind of, um, ineffable kind of flavor that sort of comes through in that um, immersion experience. And the other thing, I just want to kind of go in a different direction a little bit and a little bit um, uh, during the war, it was impossible for people who were on this side of the world, right? The, the Holocaust, World War II, it was very difficult for, for obvious reasons. And then afterwards, you know, given the Cold War situation, it was very difficult for people to actually have any kind of immersive or visual experience of what was going, what did it look like over there? Where did my grandparents come from? What was that shtetl, right? That tiny hamlet or village or town, what was that actually like, right? So this experience um, reminds me of two things. One, um, in uh, 44, the first individual to report back to the forward about his experience in Treblinka in a concentration camp and specifically about um, gas chambers being used was a carpenter named Yankel Vierbeck and his reporting because he was a carpenter and also because of the necessity to understand he had to do like a rendering and that was his choice in his reporting it was it was very much an architectural rendering of a concentration camp right so that was you know it's it critical on so many levels and you know I hate to say an immersive experience but you know reading it obviously was and then um, the other thing I was thinking about was you know flash forward the wall comes down technology advances and all of a sudden we have like digital mapping, right? So now you're looking for your grandparents' shtetl. If you're lucky enough to know and to have an address, you can kind of, go, right? You can Google map. You don't have to get a plane ticket and go. You can actually get all the, right? So this experience kind of reminded me of that in that it's also available across, right? This meta universe. You can have that experience and be on the Lower East Side. So many questions um, prompted by your great comments, Hana. Um, and um, someone named, um, where is it? Yoni Nachmani has a great idea, which is that the next photogrammetry project should be of 
the forward building, although I don't know if it would work since it's condos now, but um, maybe Hannah has enough photos in her archive that we could um, work with that. Um, and I, I, I'm going to come back to asking a little bit about what, what might be next, but I want to uh, go back, you know, you showed us the finished product and it looks amazing and everybody in the chat is saying how amazing it looked. Um, but I bet it was really hard to make. So I want to ask how long it took, how many people were involved, and what were the biggest obstacles? What were the what were the hurdles that like roadblocks, hurdles, things that didn't go as smoothly as you might have hoped? Let's see. Uh, we started. Um, I think we scanned uh, very end of September, and it was published by the first week of December. So oh my gosh, that is so fast. Is it? Okay, because you know, in newspaper terms, it was a very long project. I don't know. I come from the New York Times. That's really fast. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so you know, but uh right. So, you know, we we scanned, we um immediately started the animation work as Philip started thinking through the pathway through the model and and what we would say at each stop. And you know, this really this really took a, a quite a cinematic um production. You know, we like thought about storyboards, um, where we would place audio, where we would want people to pause and think and read something. Um, and then I'll, I'll kick it to Philip because it's it's quite difficult to write for this type of format. It's it's a very different experience than writing an article. You have to, you have to consider the, the visuals in a, in a much different way. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that? No, I was just gonna. I was gonna ask Philip a very similar version of that question, which is just. I imagine that one of the hardest things was, yeah, very few words, right? Together. You have to really pick your shots here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the frustrating thing as a writer is that this building is so well known, and there's so much information, there's so much texture that the the cutting room floor is just heaped with stuff that's not going to make it into the story. Um, the challenge um, is basically writing a story that is a set of captions to the things that you're looking at. And you have to create a fairly simple, um, a simple progress for the building that makes sense architecturally. And so, you know, if, if you uh, go and click on the link and, and go through the whole story, you'll see that you start outside in the street, you go down into the lower level tavern, go out to the backyard where the, where the bathrooms and the well was. And then you kind of repeat the process on an upper floor going from the back to the front of the building. It's basically a big sort of U on its side. Um, that doesn't let, necessarily let you tell a chronological narrative. Um, and we really wanted to focus on a couple of things. And especially because of the pandemic, we wanted to bring out the, um, the way in which these buildings changed and adapted in response to health laws and, and fears of disease. Um, so it's kind of a mad, you know, it's kind of like cobbling the little bits that you can get in, um, dangling off this incredible visual experience. The great thing about it is that the visual experience is so rich that people don't really notice all the little scenes in the narrative and the way they might if this were just a straightforward narrative without the photogrammetry. Both Jen, everybody, I mean, Annie, uh, Jenna, Philip, what have you heard from people who've been experiencing it? We can see in our chat that people really love it, these <laughs> folks, but um, what kinds of things have surprised you that you've heard or people you've heard from? What kind of impact is it having? Well, people, I mean, we heard um, from people and of course spent a lot of time looking at the, at the, at not the chat, but the feedback on, on the post page, because we learned so much from that. And I think one of the things that we know this, but it continues to amaze us is how many people across the country have connections to this building and have their own stories that they, that they want to share, right? Because this was you know, many people lived in this particular building, 7,000 over time, but there were tenements, two thirds of Manhattanites lived in a tenement in 1900. So there are so many people as the, so there's, this means something to people in, in important ways. So I think for us, it like gave us renewed sense of our, of our mission, you know, going forward about how important this building is, how it's a great place to kind of for individuals to connect to their own family history and through that, larger city and, and national history. Um, and, you know, again, I think prompts us to keep keep creating virtual ways so people in different parts of the country can stay in touch, even as we welcome them back physically, because I think it's not just one or the other, it's both that create the, the rich experience. And I, I just add to what, what Annie said. It was striking to me how 
the story gave people permission to think of their own family's memories as historical, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we, we know these, these people tell us their stories, our, our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents, we have these things, but suddenly because it was here, I think in a newspaper and had been given, I guess, the dignity of a kind of complex visual treatment, people were, were sharing those memories um, on Twitter. They're sharing them in the, in the comments appended to, to the story. And it was almost as if they were allowing themselves to think of these things as, in a sense, more palpable and more connected with a larger sense of history than maybe they had before. And one of the things that people visit that people say too is that, wow, I didn't know this was history. Like there's this conception of history as being about generals or being about, you know, military and presidents and all the things that historic houses are typically made about. So, you know, for people to see that history is about stories, about real people, about women, about workers, about, you know, all of these people that haven't necessarily fit into um, some of the traditional narratives of history, I think that's really, really important. I think, I think also that it's fun. I wanted to say it's like I, I don't want to detract from the like it's so intense that oral history that is in there. If you listen to it, right, there were diseases. There were, it was a difficult. It's really intense. I want to honor that, but at the same time, it made it so much fun. Like it's a real fun historical experience that isn't cheesy. It isn't you know it's it's very sincere and it's very uh, important. I think yeah. it's said too about the the sort of dignity and the bigness of the platform is really important. I mean, when it first popped, I was like, oh God, why didn't the forward do this? Like, this is our story. And then I was thinking about it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, including, you know, Jenna and her team, but um, it's so great that it's, I mean, you know, think about like the ghettos of, you know, Jewish neighbor, they, it's so great for this to not be in the forward, but to be in the Washington Post um, and to have people having this very public, very mainstream, very um, institutional place honoring um, that history in particular, the social history of, of an immigrant community is kind of incredible. I just um, wanted to throw few... down. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to also mention like to my eye as an archivist, this is kind of wonky, but there is so much detail in those rooms that like specialized archivist researchers have to go and find. You know, and that also made the experience for me so rich, right? The table, I think there's, like, is that fake food on the table? In the, yeah, like, our, our all archivist those would not let us keep real food in the <laughs> You can't even say that. I have to say, and I mean, I just, I love what happened with, he mentions the gas meter and it's like, this is the gas meter. I mean, that is so great. Um, and the fact that you can do it at your own pace, so you can do that is so, cause you know, when you are in the Tennessee Museum, as great as it is, it's a little crowded and your kids are being annoying and somebody else's kids are being annoying and they're in your way. Um, and this had that the, the pace and the fact that you're basically alone in there, I think, is really part of the, what's powerful about it. Um, although with the voice of the history, we we have a few questions here that are really good, um, specific questions that I probably should have asked. Three of them are the same. Angela Ferrara, Kathy Mulder and Rachel Ballou all want to know what software did you use to stitch the photos together? Good question. Oh. Should have asked that. <laughs> Okay, we used um, a software called Reality Capture to um, process the model. And then um, to do all the animations, we used a software called Cinema 4D. Um, we also, we wrote about all this at the bottom of the article. There's a methodology section because that's part of what the Lead Lab wants to do is re be really transparent about, about all the ways in which we're doing this. And we're always happy to um, answer questions if you email us. You can totally geek out if you want. Please. Um, and Please. now Richard Lobau wants to know, have you attempted to print this out, uh, mm -hmm. print out the exterior for three on a 3D printer? Oh, that's a great idea. I mean, there's so much you can do with these 3D models, right? We could print them out, which we have not tried, but now I absolutely want to. And we have a 3D printer at the office. So when we get back to the Washington Post office, maybe we'll try that. Um, I just you know, know how it works. We can sell in our gift shop. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, um, you know, you and then also render these as like a virtual reality experience. Um, it would take a lot of work. It would be a much different experience, but all the information is there to create, you know, a virtual reality experience where you're inside the goggles, you have headphones on, and you can actually walk around in this space. We so, wanted so to make that, it accessible. There's a few questions, more questions here. Well, uh, there's another specific technology question saying, could, could you use, I don't even know what this means. Could you use 2K, 4K frames from a video camera instead of stills? 
Um, you could, but there would be motion blur. Um, so, but you know, each of these stills is a four from a 4K camera. So, um, you know, like individual stills are all there. Um, but you know, with photogrammetry, we're creating a static environment. So I think it probably is better to use still. There is videogrammetry, which is when you have a bunch of video cameras pointed at like say a person standing in the middle of a dome of cameras. If you have them all on at the same time and then stitch them together, you can create a sort of hologram of a person moving around. So this is all technology that's, you know, not brand new, but our ability to process it and share it is what's really new here. We're able to get this out um, to people and make it more accessible to larger audiences. So that's great. And, and uh, I mean, I have kind of a, a big question about these different technologies and what their best applications are for different storytellings, but there's a few, and there's a few related questions I'm seeing in the chat. Sure. So I'm going to run through those and then I'm going to sum up. Uh, one question, what informed the decision to use 3D modeling rather than photographs or video footage? Um, then Robert Olesh wants to know, please explain the difference. You started to do this just now um, in this technology and the use of optical 3D goggles. Um, and I guess that that really leads to the question I was going to ask you. So you've you've done virtual reality. You've done a lot of different cutting edge, innovative storytelling techniques. I'd love you to try to give us like a little bit of I know this is probably its own lecture, but a little bit of a landscape of some of the different we, we're seeing more and more of this kind of immersive sure. something. Um, I'd love you to tell us a little bit about the differences in the different technologies and what you think why this was the right technology for this project, why something else was good for Fallujah. Well, what are the best applications for some of these different things in your mind or how would you categorize them? Okay, yeah, sure. I'll try to, I'll try to keep this short. I can really ramble on here. So please interrupt me or ask me questions. But, um, you know, virtual reality has in 3D spaces, interacting in 3D spaces has been around for a very long time, right? And the question always is, when is it going to become mainstream? And people talk about this, these hype cycles with it, right? There was a hype cycle around it, I'd say six years ago. Um, and a lot of journalism organizations, especially Especially we're experimenting with VR, um, trying to take the readers to various places. We were using a lot of 360 video. That's where we had a camera with a bunch of lenses, lenses pointed out, and we were placing it in the middle of situations so that you could pan around inside of those videos. Um, and you know, all this is because we're constantly searching for ways to make you understand a story more deeply, to feel more connected to it, or to make your own observations inside of these visual spaces. That's the whole point of the news. Make up your own mind. We'll give you the information and you, and you figure out what you think about it. Um, so, you know, virtual reality continues to evolve. It's currently in a stage where it's very popular with gaming. Uh, lots of video games coming out. Um, Facebook has or Meta, pardon me, has a um, has a headset called the Oculus Quest 2. And that has been a huge success in terms of consumers buying it. I think it's like $300 and playing video games with it. You have these little wands that you hold and you can interact in these 3D environments. That to me is incredibly exciting that there is now a venue for this. And because of that movement, you know, all these are like stepping stones to what's next. Um, I, our, my team especially is thinking, you know, we want to think about the news in 3D environments. It will never replace a photo or a, or a video or a great film. This is just another way to express um, a, a story. So if I'm really going to blow your minds, and I love that you're all so interested in this, but we're planning for a future beyond the mobile phone. What's next? We didn't always have mobile phones. Something else is going to happen. If I had to guess, it's a, a, a world where digital information is laid out in our physical world by using glasses or whatever that means. And all these experiments are sort of just like leading us along that path. We're going to evolve as that technology evolves. All right, one more much? tech question, and then we're going to bring everyone else back in because I have a really good um, question about storytelling here too. Um, Someone's asking if it's the same technology that the realtors use to bring us on the virtual tours of houses. I'm thinking- Oh uh, yeah, Matterport. So the only difference there with um, the real estate is they're, they're doing that 360 photo um, thing. So like setting down a camera with lenses all around and taking a picture. 
And then, you know, you jump to the various places where the camera stood. This is a little different in that you could, if you had access to this 3D model, you could stand anywhere you want and see in any direction. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not specifying that, you know, you can only see everything from where the angle was. We've created a completely immersive 3D model of this space. Got it. Great explanation. So we have this question, really interesting question from Cindy um, Vandenbosch saying, you all hinted at this. There's so many, I think, Annie, you said um, 7,000 people lived in that building over the years, right? So there are so many incredible stories that could be told about 97 Orchard Street. How did you decide which specific stories to highlight? How did you collaborate on the interpretive approach? Did you seek out oral histories and stories that connect directly with artifacts or architectural elements? that can be clearly seen or experienced in a 3D model. And so I think that, I th I'm sure that Philip and Annie both have some things to say about that. And I'm also interested in what Hannah says, because I think that a lot of times we will ask her a question about the archive and she too has to pick, well, there's a lot of ways to answer this question. How did we cover X thing? How do we cover Y thing? Which character, which writer represents that best? So start with Annie and Philip about how did you pick which things to highlight in this particular tour? Oh, okay. So uh, Cindy, um, Cindy knows the answer, I think, to that question because she worked at the Tenement Museum for many years and helped shape it. But um, as you know, at the Tenement Museum, we in general pick the stories in order to represent different moments in time and also to represent the different uh, varieties or different groups of people who lived in the tenement over time, right? So if you step, if you only told the story of 1900, it would be a mostly East European Jewish story, but by telling 1880 or 1860, you're capturing a German story, an Irish story, and by going into the 1930s, an Italian story. And in our second tenement, the one that I'm in, we tell a Chinese story, a Puerto Rican story, and a story of refugee uh, uh, survivors of the Holocaust who came and created a new life here. So our goal in choosing the stories is to be able uh, overall to tell a multi-ethnic, multi-racial story of, of, of New York City. Someone else is asking, and I wonder, Philip, if you thought about this when you were doing it. Someone else is asking, might there be a way to add, you know, another another set of stories? And I suppose there could have been like a button, you know, in 1900, click here to hear that family. And so I wonder, Philip, how you thought about that those those that pick, those selection decisions. Well, a lot of what a lot of the material you had, of course, was was from the Tenement Museum. So we had those narratives, and it was it, the challenge was a way to find what we can add to that. The, the thing that I had in the back of my mind was remembering having read Jacob Rees and seeing these photographs. And that's a very public sense of these buildings. And it, it, it's a sort of public history. It's not a part of my personal history. My, my family doesn't really have these memories, but they seemed almost like my own memories of these buildings because they're so familiar. <laughs> So I was really interested in finding places where the narratives that the Tenement Museum had uncovered could shed light on these narratives that, that Reese had passed on, and particularly those ones where maybe he wasn't giving us the whole story. Maybe his political agenda, his progressive agenda, was kind of inflecting these stories for a particular end. And so I found it interesting, for example, to have people say, um, yeah, there are some unhappy times here, but..." We lived here. We did, you know, our families remember this in a certainly fond way. We saw that come out in the comments to the story. Mm -hmm. That's that for me was really fascinating. Um, and it it in a sense it almost took these black and white photographs and made them feel like they were in color. Mm -hmm. Love that. And it creates a fuller picture, right? Because if you're on the one hand telling the story of hard times and you're telling about how people reacted to those hard times, it's a story of agency and dignity and you know all of that that you know creates a story of resilience that I think we're all looking for at this moment in time in particular. Mm -hmm. Con, I know you struggle with this issue, right? You've got this fullness of the history and it's like, how do you decide where to focus? God, well, most times I think the the impact or the, you know, the decision is kind of made for me, <laughs> like, the, you know, what's being asked of me or what, what, huh. and a lot of times also, like, for instance, there was just an op-ed that we did a couple of weeks ago about the Uyghur, the situation with the Uyghur and the genocide there. And that writer specifically asked me to, um, offer something from our archives, like offer something historical. So because it was genocide, of course, you know, it ended up being um, about the Warsaw ghetto uprising for us about the Holocaust, you know, how did we cover the, the very beginnings of fascism? How did we, you know, so that's like a very specific ask, but then there are other times where I'm just offering 
I guess we would say like B-roll, like background color, like, you know, look, look, kind of like we just did, right? Like, let's talk about the building. What was the building? What like? I'm well, thinking about Hannah is, I feel like so many times I ask you a question and there are these characters, I'm remembering actually way back to one of the first things we did together where you did this thing for Sukkot with the Ushbizin women. And anyway, you have these characters that you want to bring forward, I think, that have, they have for whatever reason, a writer or a character in the news that has stuck with you, from and and you I don't know you do that like selecting these things that you just connect with personally or whatever I don't know oh okay well that's definitely true I think for for everybody in this kind of work there are right you have your 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 items I'm sure in the in the building on Orchard Street there are things that just kind of grab you and um definitely for sure and I have to say that you know underlying you know it, yeah here here are my cards <laughs> I really feel very strongly that Yiddish journalists lived a really difficult life they wrote, obviously they chose to write in Yiddish, you know, the, the history, the wheel was turning towards English and in Jewish culture towards Hebrew. And, you know, their work was just kind of dropped and it was a very difficult position to be in. So a lot of times, you know, that that's what I'm going for. Like, here's this great writer who covered the story of, you know, uh, the building and nobody knows who Fogel is. And he was like a labor writer. At one point, I know this just from reading the paper, he um, covered Cook County for us. He talked about, you know, the, the mess in the um, state uh, hospitals in um, Cook County. So, you know, there are these like, and obviously, obviously like, you know, a barn burner, so to speak, you know, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire for us was like a huge story, but, Ab Khan, our founding editor, sent a poet to cover. He sent Morris Rosenfall, no, known as the sweatshop poet. He sent a poet to cover, right, on the streets of New York. They're going up. The neighborhood's going up in flames. We lost over 100, you know, 146, I think, young women, most of whom were living in tenements like that building on Orchard Street, right? And he sent a poet to talk about it. So th those, obviously, inspired you know, decision. they grabbed me. And then women, you know. For sure. Women writing in Yiddish, like forget it. The men had a hard time, the women, like, you know, that's a really hard road. So, um, so I would say. We have a couple of um, economic questions I want to get to. Alexander Magoon, first of all, says, for the sake of emulating this, I don't know where Alexander works or what he does, but um, for the sake of emulating, is there, a, is there a total cost or budget? Like about how much does it cost to make this thing? If you can estimate in sort of staff time and expenses. We don't usually share that sort of information. I, I am sorry to say. Um, Wait, tell us, uh, I mean, you, you, I don't think you answered before when I asked about how many people worked on it. Like right, sure. We had a 3D animator who did all the animations. We had a team of um, uh, two people working on uh, the photogrammetry and the stitching. And then, you know, in order to make this available to audiences, we had to do a lot of optimizing and rendering. Um, so there were there was a developer and a designer, and then and then Philip and I also on the project. And you so, both, and I mean, with those people working pretty much full time on it for a couple months. We worked full time on it for about two months. Yeah. The other economic question is really interesting and important one, which is to say, Claire Brandt says many house museums rely on in person visitorship and admission fees. Um, how do we think this kind of technology and, uh, you know, a place like the Washington Post publishing something like this, um, will affect that kind of thing? How does it, can, is that gonna, how is it gonna, she says, how is it gonna support museums and their need to attract people outside of the virtual world? Mm -hmm. Are you worried about that, Annie? That people will stop coming because they can go see this? I worry about everything, but <laughs> <laughs> I worry about everything actually except that. And but I thank you so much for your concern about the well-being of cultural institutions at this time because it is really important. Before the pandemic, the Tenement Museum relied on earned income, so visitors' tickets um, for about eighty percent of its budget. So clearly, the pandemic has we're in we're we're, we're figuring out a way to operate in in different ways, um, but what we found is that virtual is also a way to bring people in. Um, and so we do virtual field trips, for example, and we do virtual programs and concerts, some of which we have for free, but people have been extremely generous. So we say something is free, and we also explain like doing this, creating this Yiddish concert of Morris Rosenfeld poems put to music in this apartment costs money. So if you're able to support us, that's wonderful. So I think it's it's kind of like a communal endeavor, right? So that if these virtual things are ways to connect and, and, and it helps you experience the cultural institution in other ways, then 
it's wonderful to send in, you know, $5 or $10. That absolutely helps. Um, and to kind of look at the program offerings that we're doing. So this was not the first time the Tenement Museum did something virtual. And we've been working with digital storytelling for a long time. Um, so definitely look at what the museums and the cultural institutions themselves are offering with regard to virtual Great. programs. I think my boss and the development um, VP would be mad if I did not say, we too like to offer programs for free, but we are a nonprofit, a reader supported nonprofit. And if you would like to make a donation because you like this program, um, we can, um, oh, we already have a link in the chat. Thank you, Gabby Brooks, who's producing this event for popping that in there. And I'm sure there'll also be a donate link in the email that you'll get tomorrow. Um, we only have a few minutes left. So here's what we're gonna do. First of all, I wanna thank again, Gabby and each of you for being here and also Dina Cooperman who helped us put this together and our partners at the Washington Post. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for being with us for this incredibly interesting hour. As I said, we are going to email you tomorrow with the link to the project and the video and opportunities to connect with future um, forward events. We have something coming up next week with um, Joshua Molina and Rabbi Shira Stutman who have a new podcast. I'll be interviewing them. Also interviewing um, next week, Jonathan Greenblatt of the ADL about his new book. And we have other things on the events calendar and in the events newsletter. Um, my last question, I'm gonna ask um, Jenna a little bit. And I wanna ask Jenna, what other, what the, what's, what's next? What, what are we next gonna see this technology applied to if you can give us some hints. And I'd love to hear from the, the others about um, what you think would be great places to take this technology. And I would especially love it if people in the chat would write us some suggestions of places that they would like to be taken via photogrammetry or other immersive technologies. We already have the forward building as a suggestion. Please <laughs> pop your other ideas in the chat and let's talk about what, what, other would, what other places or experiences or stories would be great for this, do you think? I mean, it's it's any place where the actual space gives it, it lends some sort of extra understanding to the story. So, um, you know, we're thinking about um, a travel story. We could take you underwater. You know, we could we could um, take you to all sorts of um, uh, you know various cultural sites throughout the world. So I can't reveal too much, but there's little hints in there and where we hope to go. We're really thinking about you know when you can hear a place and look around at your own leisure and understand the world through your own eyes. That's those are the types of stories we're mostly interested in. And Philip, I imagine you've given them a list of what you were places you could imagine doing this with, but what, what are some of your, where would you like to take readers? Well, I, I'm interested in two things. One, I'm interested in, in, in pathways. There's a very linear way in which this, this technology walks you through space. So I'm interested in kind of um, paths that people take in their ordinary lives and, or their professional lives. Um, I'm also interested in more vernacular spaces, split level houses, Cape Cods, Victorian three-story bay window buildings. You know, these things we pass in the street and you look and you think, I wonder what it's like in there. Um, this is a wonderful technology for, for showing you that. Great. Hannah, any suggestions? Well, yeah, whoever said the building, the forward building, I'm not gonna, yeah, I, I can't get, get off of that. But um, I think also, um, I really like places um, that jut, that are sort of like the last point, you know, like Coney Island, right, in New York, Brighton Beach, Coney Island, that whole walk you do to get like right to the end and you're like looking at Europe. I kind of like those kind of points. And the same at Provincetown in Cape Cod, you know, it supposedly that's actually where the pilgrims landed. And it's just like this very, very early, but very rich historically uh, kind of place in the- Both, both you and Philip talking about pathways reminded me, I actually did a project very much like this when I was at the New York Times, um, I think not as not as high tech. I don't think it was photogrammetry. I don't remember, but it was also thousands of photos stitched together. I'm putting it in the chat. It was after the 2014 war in Gaza, a photographer um, took these thousands of photos while walking certain paths with, with six characters, three in Gaza and three in Israel. Um, and I just put the link in the chat for that. It wasn't I mean, it wasn't in this immersive way because it was these six different paths, um, but I think it was very similar. Um, Annie, I'm going to give you the last word. I, I Oops. Oh, I'm dying of curiosity. Okay. <laughs> I think you, it, it froze it for froze. a second, Jody. Oh, sorry. I, 
I'm sorry about that. Um, I was asking about other museums that mm -hmm. use similar, that also take the immersive approach that you like and mm -hmm. work with. And also, of course, if you have a wish list of someplace you'd you'd like to use this technology, and you can also close us out with um, last words from the Tenet Museum. You know, I think. Um... I would like to see this applied to any ordinary building or any like an apartment building in New York City today, like go to Queens, go somewhere else and tell the stories of people who live here today, because, you know, I think capturing contemporary stories in this way um, and seeing people where they live and what their really? stories are, it would be super, super exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I guess in terms of the come visit us. I'm at the Tenement. We're open every day, seven days a week. And I think one of the things you don't get, as wonderful as this is, one of the things you don't get from the virtual experience or the photogrammetry um, is talking to other people. And the best thing about the Tenement Museum in many ways are our educators and the way in which all of you come together to form a group of people to talk. And I think during the pandemic, one of the things we've lo we lost out on, you know, when we were closed was having real live conversations and learning together. So again, as wonderful as all of this is, and I'm a huge, huge, huge fan, and I'm, you know, so impressed. I also want to kind of say all that stuff that happens in the chat, it's amazing when it happens in person as well. So come back home to the Tenement Museum. <laughs> Thank you, Annie and Jenna and Hannah and Philip and Gabby Brooks for hosting and, and pro programming this event. I'm Jody Rejoin. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. I just want to reflect for just a second. The Forward is an organization that was founded in 1897 in this very neighborhood. And we are in the middle of undergoing a transformation to be a fully digital, you know, a uh, news organization that uses as much innovative storytelling tools as we can to meet today's reader needs. And one of our most important mission principles is the idea of leveraging our history for the audience of today. And I feel like this project and this conversation is just so amazing because one of the other big things for us is connecting people and creating community. And I feel I'm so grateful to the hundreds of you who came today and to our speakers for creating that opportunity to really connect to history and to each other and to what's going on today. So thank you for all of your participation, wonderful questions, wonderful comments, mm -hmm. and we'll see you next time on Zoom or at the Tenement Museum or on the Washington Post website. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you, bye.